Is the future of Bank of America sustainable? And should Google buy Tesla? You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show, folks. I am David Hansen, today joined by Fool.com's John Reeves. Thanks for being here, John. Hey, David. Thank you. We are going to start the show like we always do, looking at the, today's headlines. And the first one we got is from the Wall Street Journal here, and it's about Bank of America in the news again. Bank of America weighs prohibiting overdrafts. So Bank of America makes a lot of their money from fees. A couple years ago, they came out and said, we're not going to do overdrafts at point of sale transactions anymore. So you can't go out and buy a cup of coffee and get an overdraft fee without opting into some coverage. And now this article is saying that Bank of America is considering completely doing away with overdrafts, even when you write a check, when you go to an ATM. Is this good news for Bank of America shareholders or better news for Bank of America customers? Yeah, you know, great question. I think the first thing I thought of is that, you know, this is a lot of money. This mm -hmm. is not, it is, this is billions of dollars. But interestingly enough, I think there's two sides to it. On the one hand, it hurts them financially, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I wonder, is this maybe something that is good for customers? I mean, they've struggled with their reputation and it's more transparent. It's sort of protecting customers from themselves. And you know what? If you're, if you're in a situation where you're in an overdraft and mm -hmm. then you have to pay a fee on top of that, it's mm -hmm. not great customer experience. So, you know, I don't know. It could possibly have a little bit of upside for that. Yeah, bank. it's a little bit of a, I mean, you don't know where to, where to feel if you're an investor here. It's, okay, I feel good that they're maybe not going to have as many complaints anymore, mm -hmm. but you, you are giving up that revenue. And they don't break out uh, overdraft fee revenue very specifically right. in their income statement, mm -hmm. so it's kind of lumped into these uh, consumer service charge fees um, within their income statement there. So we don't have a clear picture about how much they exactly make from overdrafts, but I think you're right. I think it is in the billions probably if we're looking at an annual thing. So we're going to talk a little bit more about Bank of America's yeah. fees later in the show, but I thought that was an interesting headline. Moving on to the next one, also from the Wall Street Journal. This one is Morgan Stanley. They reported earnings this morning. Morgan Stanley swings to profit on strong wealth management results. So this is a little bit different than what we saw from Goldman Sachs yesterday. Goldman mm -hmm. Sachs reported earnings, and the market did not like their earnings. They were down. <laughs> and a big reason was fixed income trading. That was also down at Morgan Stanley. But like the headline says, the wealth management business mm -hmm. doing very well. And this is something that we've seen across the board, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's interesting. So Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, when, you know, as part of Bank of America, their, their wealth management area is doing well. Mm -hmm. Edward Jones, I know, has been performing well. This has been an area that's been pretty profitable mm -hmm. um, in recent months. And, and I think that with the market uh, continuing to go up and, and people are feeling good about investing, this is a good business, at least for right now. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the difference between Goldman and Morgan Stanley. Both had trading that was down. And some people might wonder, well, why, why wasn't Morgan Stanley as affected as mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs was? And you have to look at where these banks make their revenue. And Goldman Sachs makes a lot more of its revenue from these trading businesses. Mm -hmm. That wealth management business over at Morgan Stanley is an increasingly large part mm -hmm. of their business since they bought the rest of that stake from Citigroup with, with, Smith, with Smith Barney. Um, so when you look at Morgan Stanley, they're trying to move a little bit away from the trading side of things, maybe reduce the risk there, and focus more on the wealth management business. So far, it seems to be working out pretty well. Yeah, and you know, and I think too is what I think that they deserve a lot of credit for some of the operational mm -hmm. success because you know they've gotten they've eliminated some of the glitches and the, their financial advisory mm -hmm. force is, is working more effectively. So I think they've done some good work there in mm -hmm. addition to benefiting some from the conditions at the moment. Absolutely. All right, moving on to the last headline of the day. This wasn't from this morning, but uh, from a couple days ago. And this is from Grumpy Old Accountants. And the headline is, Twitter's S1, more social media company IPO drama. So we've talked about the, the Twitter IPO in the show mm -hmm. from the perspective of Goldman Sachs is the lead underwriter on the offering. Bank of America is involved. JP Morgan's involved. But this article was talking just a little bit more about the Twitter business model. Mm -hmm. And what exactly is their long-term strategy? And the article points out that that's not exactly clear, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, I, I actually thought this article was really an eye opener, mm -hmm. and I think like a lot of people, you know, I'm a Twitter user, and when it when you know the IPO was announced, you know, people are excited. Hey, you know, this is this is a company that is you know we we like to use it, and it's going to be able to take advantage of the trends in mobile, mm -hmm. and you know, what's not to like? But the closer you look, you know, you know. What's their business model? How are they going to? Uh, how does their advertising strategy work? For example, yeah, and it's, the, it's not clear. The, the article points out that 
their their customers aren't you and I per se. Mm. It's not the users of, of the interface. The customers are advertisers, and, and they say in kind of cryptic language that they they have a, a better offering that they can offer better mm -hmm. things than other people. But it doesn't exactly say how effective the ads have been. So there's definitely a lot of uh, unknowns here with Twitter. So if you read the article and you go out to the website and read that article from Grumpy Accountants, it doesn't make you feel great. But it also made me think. You, you, I don't think you can look at the, the Twitters of the world, these mm -hmm. up-and-coming social media IPOs, and value them on a traditional basis. I think mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're trying to get your head around evaluation, obviously very hard for a company like this that's not profitable yet, not even public yet, I think there's, the, there's a little bit of an X factor. I mean, mm -hmm. you're paying for what could they innovate, uh, not necessarily what they're doing today. And I think you see that across the board mm -hmm. at these tech companies. When these big IPOs come up, all these investment banks fight tooth and nail for them. Uh, the Facebooks of the world, the Twitters of the world, I think you're paying for that X factor. You're paying for kind of the culture mm -hmm. and, and the intelligence behind the company. So maybe Twitter doesn't look like a good buy on paper. I mean, that's what the article definitely makes it seem that way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but there still is that X factor in terms of they've got a lot of smart people out there working with it. They're going to have a fair amount of cash, cash in their hands going forward. So. Maybe there's still hope. I'm not. I'm certainly not looking at Twitter and saying this is doomed. Yeah, yeah. You know, and one of the things that's great about the piece is I think that it makes that case as well. Mm -hmm. Like that. Hey, you know what? We're not saying this is bad. It's just it's a black box. It's hard to right. tell what's going on in there. Mm -hmm. And unlike Google and Facebook, which were more mature businesses, this one's still in the earlier stages. But I think that the, I, I I circled uh, the the damning line at the end was that the takeaway is. This is a, a, a Twitter has an undifferentiated strategy, an unclear business model, and uncontrolled accounting and reporting. I mean, that doesn't <laughs> doesn't sound great. <laughs> Paint a well, the, well the, the one thing that is clear is that the one the one party that's going to make money in this situation is the investment banks. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. We know that they're going to get their <laughs> fees. So whether Twitter's successful in, in the future, Goldman Sachs and Bank of America and J.P. Morgan, they're still going to make their underwriting fees on this deal. So if you're an investor in those banks. You know, are not interested in Twitter, you're still going to get a, a little bit of a cut here. Yeah. All right, moving on to uh, a deeper look, mm -hmm. a little bit of a more in depth commentary here on Bank of America mm -hmm. and over on, on fool.com. Uh, you and a couple of our other of our colleagues, you focus on a little bit more investigative journalism and looking mm -hmm. into things and writing more in depth pieces mm -hmm. uh, rather than what's the norm on fool.com. And one of the pieces that you guys have been working on, and which I think will be published next week, in that time time period, I think, uh, is about Bank of America. Mm -hmm. And the stock's been on a great run. Mm -hmm. uh, our viewers, our listeners, if you follow the banking sector, everyone knows that Bank of America the last year and a half has been a great stock to own. And the mm -hmm. company's return to profitability. Things may be looking up, but you guys have pointed out some things that maybe don't sound so so hot, right? Yeah, so, so the Bank of America story comes directly from our editorial content at fool.com, mm -hmm. and that is this. We write about Bank of America a lot, and as you know, right, mm -hmm. the, the comments from our readers can really go pretty <laughs> negative, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think their reputation right now is poor, and their relationship with their customers is not very good. Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of disconnect. On the one hand, a return to profitability and a re return to you know, operational strength. And you know what? Good for them, too, mm -hmm. and they're not criticizing that. But on the other hand, you have an army of customers, right? They have, you know, what, 48 million households. Right. Um, and, and, you know, the, the lowest reputation among big banks in America right now. So, so is this sustainable? Can you continue your return to profitability and growth while at the same time alienating your customers? Is, at some point, does this sort of fall apart? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking, taking a closer look, is like trying to, try to understand this maybe a bit better. So, so maybe not necessarily predicting the demise here, but maybe just saying, could this be a thorn in the side over the next five, 10 years to, to really hold back the company exactly. and stock? I mean, I think our hypothesis is that they have to address this mm -hmm. poor reputation problem. And there's where the, the, the tension for the company comes in, right? Because in order to grow the business, which, you know, they, they went through a rocky patch with the financial crisis, mm -hmm. and then they had the overhang of all the litigation and, and all of the settlements. They're trying to get back on their feet and now return to growth, right? 
But unfortunately, if that growth comes from more fees and mm -hmm. more upsell and more sort of, you know, lack of transparency, you're only going to exacerbate that poor mm -hmm. reputation that they already have. So right. they're in a bit of a catch-22. Can they do it? I mean, sure, I think they can, but I think it's probably a much harder putt mm -hmm. than the market is is uh, is assessing it as. Right, and the interesting thing about Bank of America, and you guys point this out, is their strategy. I mean, this isn't a hidden strategy that Bank of America has. They, they've come to investors, they've come mm -hmm. to customers and said, this is what we want to do. They have, you, you mentioned 48 million households or mm -hmm. customers out there, and 40 of them, 40 million, yeah. fall in, the, in this classification called retail. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially a, a, a tag for someone who's not super affluent. Uh, they're kind of just the everyday customer, don't have a ton of money in their account, don't have a ton of products with, with the bank. And then the other 8 million mm -hmm. are, are known as preferred customers, and these are the high-end, more wealthy clients. And the interesting part of this, this, uh, this problem is, I think, is a lot of the hate and a lot of the bad reputational risk comes from that 40 million. Yeah, yeah. But the 8 million are the profitable ones. Mm -hmm. So, and especially when you lo look at something like deposits, okay, so 8 million compared to 40 million people, mm -hmm. five times ma more many people, five times the, pe the customers in that retail base, but they have 60% less deposits. So Bank of America is getting an overwhelmingly strong amount of their business from this small group of people. And I think the risk is, that that reputation from the 40 million starts to impact right. the 8 million. I think that's where the big risk is. If they can mitigate the risk from the 40 million and not have that impact their high-end customers, I think they can succeed. But my concern would be, and I think this is what you guys point out in the article, is if the hatred and the reputational risk becomes so great with such a large base, then even the high-end customers could start to leave. Yeah, and also too, you know, it's it's not a moat between the 40 million and the 8 million, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of the 40, part of the strategy is that some of the 40 move we'll into move the, right? You know what I mean? So it's a it's sort of a it, it, you know on paper, by the way, it's a nice model, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 then as as people as people get older and they get wealthier, then then some of the wealth management that we're talking right. about mm -hmm. comes into play, right? So it's an additional uh, additional product and and what have you. But but yeah, I I feel that it's not easy to to you know have, oh, we got the reputation over here, as, as long as these yeah. guys are happy, but because yeah, yeah. there's too much interplay. And um, so, yeah, I mm -hmm. think that reputation thing is pretty hard to kind of mm -hmm. compartmentalize. And I think you make a great point that it is a great business model yeah. on paper. It makes a lot of sense. It's just a question of, can they execute it? And that's really going to be the question, because if they can execute it and they can reduce the cost of, of those 40 million people that aren't very profitable, and continue to serve the high end, I think this can be a very good business. It's just a question of whether they can do that. And as an investor, I think you have to look out and say, what is the probability of that happening? I think yeah. you have to look at it that way. If it's, if you personally think it's a 90% chance that they can do that, I think you are a believer in the Bank of America, the company and the stock. But if you, if you don't think they can do that and they, and they don't execute, and they haven't showed a great history of executing very nimbly. We saw that with the $5 debit fee proposals. Mm -hmm. They've made gaffes before. Yeah. So it's a question of will they continue to do that. Um, I'm not a shareholder. I'm assuming you're not a shareholder yeah, I'm either. Not a shareholder. Um, but ironically, you know, it's funny is I, I am a customer, mm -hmm. which is, you know, um, and it's one of those things that, and this is another strength of their model, uh, is that a lot of us, you know, somewhere along the line, you become a you've become a bank of a mustard, and it's not an easy thing to to leave. Right. And and of course, there's no there's no pressure, or there's no whatever. But it's just like m many of us find transitioning bank accounts mm -hmm. to be difficult with all your direct debits, and you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. the, the, it's easier to do nothing with your bank account than it is to move, especially Absolutely. as you build up you know different accounts and different right. things over time. So yes, yeah. it'll it'll certainly be an interesting story to watch unfold yeah. over the next couple of years, and I think that's what it's going to be. This isn't going to be a We'll know by the end of 2013 whether they're right. going to be successful. It's going to be a, an, an evolving story, and it'll be an interesting one to watch. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to our next segment. We're going to go play a little game. A little too much Bank of America talk. Yeah. Right let's, light, let's lighten it yeah. up. Right? We're, going to play, we're going to play a game called Would You Rather. This is basically, it's just, mm -hmm. just as it sounds. We present a situation, say, would you rather do this or that? And we go back and forth and pick. Our first scenario of the day is involving J.P. Morgan and Berkshire Hathaway. So the scenario is, would you rather have $10,000 of Berkshire Hathaway stock or $12,500 
of J.P. Morgan stock. And do I get? Is there any limit on how long I have to hold? No, no limits here. Okay. The rest of your life, which one do you want? You have to pick today. Um, I take the J.P. Morgan stock. Um, okay. Obviously, you know. I, under the most extreme, because I could I could sell it today and and, and pocket the gain mm -hmm. and then do you know, um, but but yeah you know it's funny I'm I'm not personally if I, I, I probably wouldn't invest in in J P Morgan under mm -hmm. most conditions but it, you know given given that sort of premium right. <laughs> I mean seems like mm -hmm. a, a, a no brainer to I, take the J P I think uh, I think I'm going to agree with you and I I did kind of some back of the envelope math here on it so if you start out with ten thousand mm -hmm. of Berkshire versus 1250 or 12,500 of, uh, of JP Morgan over a five year period, the annual return uh, that you'd have to get it at JP Morgan would, could be 5% less than yeah. Berkshire yeah. and you'd still break even there. So that's the difference. So if you got 15% a year at Berkshire and only 10% a year at JP Morgan, you'd break ev even there. So as, as that's the discrepancy and I think it's not as clear cut, but I think I would go with, with yeah. JP Morgan as well. All right, our next scenario is involving Visa here. It says, this one's a little more in-depth. It says, we'd rather have $10,000 of Visa stock that you can't sell for 25 years or $9,000 of Visa stock and be able to sell whenever you want. Mm -hmm. What are yeah. your thoughts? So that one is a trickier one, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I didn't actually do the math on paper, but I kind of did it in my head. And, and so if my first instinct was tempted to go, oh, you know, I could, you know, get the nine and, and, and put in a growth stock and mm -hmm. I don't know, by year five or whatever. <laughs> right. But then I thought, you know what, 25 years um, for me, that, lo that looks like um, it's, you know, probably, I'm probably retired by then, mm -hmm. but you know what, not a bad stock for retirement, good company. Um, you're getting a premium right out of the gate, and mm -hmm. it would be the type of company that I would like in my portfolio yeah. for the long term. So I would take the Visa stock. I think I would agree with you holding it 25 years. Yeah. If this was JC Penny. Yeah. Uh, I would say I'd probably take the nine and have the ability yeah. to, to sell what yeah. I want there. But you look at Visa, this is a business that I try to find competitors that could knock Visa off, other than MasterCard. They're kind of a duopoly in the space, but I look outside of those two players, and it's just very hard to find someone that is a huge threat uh, to Visa and MasterCard, in my opinion. And I don't think the stock looks super cheap today. I, I don't think it's very expensive. I think it's pretty fairly valued. I think you're getting a mm -hmm. great business, and the price is priced accordingly for a great mm -hmm. business there. Over 25 years, I'm sure this stock's gonna have its ups and downs. But in 25 years from now, I, I still think Visa, I still think we're going to be swiping cards or using our phones or whatever it is. I still think the payments are going to be running through Visa. So I'm going with the 10,000, yeah. holding for 20, 25 years. Moving on to the last would you rather. This one's a little fun. This one is, would you rather have to put salsa on everything you eat for the rest of your life or only eat one thing for the rest of your life? <laughs> what do you say? Are you a salt fan of salsa here? Yeah, well, you know, Probably as much as the next guy, right? But um, um, but I have to do the salsa thing. I can't think of the one food that you mm -hmm. could eat that you wouldn't get scurvy uh, <laughs> from. So you know what I mean. Other than you know a one a day vitamin and some eggs or something, I can't imagine what mm -hmm. the one food would be that would keep you alive. So I'm gonna go with salsa on everything. God, and I'm gonna have to agree with you again. <laughs> here. We're just Got some, some group think here. But, but what is the one food that you can eat oh, every man, day? I don't know. I'm An apple? You'd get, you, <laughs> you'd, you'd keep the doctor right there. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know. You'd get so sick of it. You'd have four apples and you'd be like, I'm done with apples. Uh, never having again. But salsa, you can put it on eggs. You can put it on burritos. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can mix it up yeah, a little you bit. Can so get, you can make it rice. I'm going, I'm going with the salsa. So mm -hmm. we'll see. All right, moving on to the last segment of the day on the Twitter sphere, looking at a couple tweets. Mm -hmm. To end the day, our first tweet is from Elliot Turner. He's at Elliot Turn. Remember just a week ago when some tweeters were talking about the massive head and shoulders in Google? And head and shoulders there, he's not talking about the shampoo. He's <laughs> talking about the technical in indicators that some investors or probably some traders look at. Um, of course, we don't usually talk about tech too much on this show, but Google reported earnings yesterday. Mm -hmm. I guess they were great. The stock's up 12 12 or something percent today. And I just wanted to highlight, there can be a case for looking at a technical thing sometimes, I mm -hmm. think, maybe, I don't personally, but I think it just goes to show you that the underlying business is much more important than whether what the stock chart looks like. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you follow a similar thesis when you're investing? Oh, do you yeah. look at these charts at yeah, all? Yeah, you know what's funny, it's like, and maybe this is something that other people do too, is that 
I just try to simplify my mm -hmm. own personal investing, and I realize that everyone has their own different right. styles, and, and that's great. And one of the things at The Fool is we, we respect that people have different strategies. Mm -hmm. My own personal one is to keep it simple. So mm -hmm. technical analysis, I mean, it, it seems crazy to me, mm -hmm. but I'm sure people use right. it successfully in trading and, mm -hmm. and doing getting in and out of big positions and what have you. But mm -hmm. it's not something that I would do and, and pay no attention to it. Yeah. Uh, and I try to simplify. And Google is one of my biggest holdings in my oh, there portfolio. there you go. Congratulations. So, today's a good day for me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Moving on to the next tweet. This one is from John Reeves. That's you. And the tweet was, three reasons to worry about America's economic future. And you link out to an article that you wrote earlier this week. You don't have to give us all three, but what was the one reason that, that you were looking at that is most concerning for you? Yeah, so so the 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 purpose of the article was in it, it might it might sound to political. Be pessimistic. Yeah, but the purpose <laughs> was just to look at some big long term trends mm -hmm. in facing the economy and, and kind of look at it as much as you can, these things in an objective way. Like, right. hey, look, you know what? Let's leave politics aside for a moment and just look at, hey, what do these economic trends mean? And one of them, of course, is that you know there's rising income inequality. Mm -hmm. Another one is like the poor, the dreadful state of America's education system. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's a parent knows that one. And that one's a sort of a nonpartisan issue. It's right. just like you know what's going on. I think we're all familiar with the fact that American kids per are are last in math, mm -hmm. but they're number one in their confidence in their math abilities. There you go. So you know what I mean? Like, that's a problem. But the biggest problem of all, though, to answer your question, is um, I think it, the biggest, what we, we should call a risk factor, mm -hmm. right, right, is climate change. We don't know what the impact that will be on the economy, but it feels like um, a pretty big black swan event. You know what I mean? That, hey, we don't know what the probability is, but if it were to play out mm -hmm. as a worst case scenario, the costs could be enormous and it would require a lot of change on the fly, which we saw this week our political system mm -hmm. is not necessarily good at, yeah. is coming up with uh, swift, good decisions. <laughs> no, I, th I, thought it was, I thought it was great that you pointed that out. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen with, with climate change, but it, it's always good to think about there are all these risks mm -hmm. and we have to still find good companies to invest in through. It's not like the risk of climate change is going to keep a lot of people from investing in index funds. Right. And, and it shouldn't. Uh, right. but, it, but it's nice to be aware that there are these risks out there that you can't really put solid probabilities on, mm -hmm. just to be aware of them. And like you said, it's much more of a, of a black swan rather than, oh, it's gonna have, a, it's gonna have an impact on, on a bad quarter. This is much more of a, of a longer, longer tail risk there, but we'll see what happens. But and I you know, an interesting side note to the climate change issue is that a lot of companies are addressing it mm -hmm. in different ways. So it's an issue now, and, and, it's, and some companies are dealing with it at the, at the, at the local level, at mm -hmm. the, you know, at, the, at their business level. Right. And um, so it's something to be mindful of and, and think about which, which directions companies are going in order to combat that, maybe in their own business, mm -hmm. but also for those companies that are looking at the, at the bigger picture of the right. country, the, the globe, whatever. You know? Absolutely. So. All right, moving on to the last tweet. It is from Tom Gardner, our founder and CEO here at The Fool. He says, I recommend that Google use stock to buy Tesla at $250 a share, then put Elon Musk in charge of Google's R&D forever with limitless resources. I don't know if that's going to happen, but would, <laughs> would everyone's head just explode if that happened? Would everyone on Wall Street's head just explode? I love that idea. I mean, doesn't it seem like such a great fit? You know, you mm -hmm. have... Uh, Tesla cars with the with the self you know the automated driving capabilities that Google has pioneered and you know what kind of uh, mm -hmm. results would come out of that. So anyway, it sounds like a great idea. I don't know what the finances look like, right, exactly. <laughs> like that or the cultures mm -hmm. either. But uh, you know, at first glance, it sounds like a pretty cool. And idea we too. we talked about Wall Street being being happy regardless of what happens with yeah. Twitter. Can you imagine the investment banks that would be, it'd be a feeding frenzy trying to get on a deal of this magnitude yeah. and of that, yeah. the reputation that would come along with, with going something like that. So I don't think Tom has any inside information here in terms of whether Google is actually considering that, but I thought that was a fun tweet and people's heads would probably just explode yeah. if that happened. I think it's funny when you look at Google and Apple, of course, like the, the amount of cash that they're generating mm -hmm. and the amount of cash that they have 
brings these sort of scenarios. I mean, they, at some point they'll be able to buy, you know, Western European countries, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> it's, it's getting a little ridiculous. <laughs> we'll see. Well, well, thanks for being here. That's our show for today. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. We are at TMF Financials. You can tweet us your questions, comments, and we'll address them right here on the show. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.